We are celebrating the feast of Saint Michael and all angels, hence the incense, it's a feast. And this is one of my favourite holy days. It has a really big tradition around it. In some places and at some times, it was a bigger celebration than Christmas itself. It comes every year on the 29th of September, so that was Friday this year, just after the autumn equinox. So that makes it one of the quarter days, what's called the quarter day in church tradition. So I'm going to mainly talk about angels today. Now, Saint, Saint Michael and all that. Saint is a confusing uh, title for Michael, really. Michael is an angel, he's an archangel, one of the really big important ones. And the archangel Michael is mentioned several times in scripture. He's often associated with protection and with spiritual warfare. It's often depicted with a sword. Spiritual warfare, the defeat of malevolent forces, of confusion, powers that are opposed to God. By spiritual warfare, we might understand something like our inner struggle, the spiritual, the soulful, the inner wrestling that's going on. Now Michael has a gentle side too. Michael is also associated with guarding our souls. Guarding our souls is a beautiful poetry of prayers from some traditions, such as up north in Scotland. Guarding our souls while we sleep. Guarding our souls at the time of death. Carrying us, carrying our souls to heaven. And you might know this bedtime prayer that my son learnt at school, it was a church school. He learnt this when he was little and we used to say it before he went to sleep. Lord, keep us safe this night, secure from all our fears. May angels guard us while we sleep till morning light appears. Now in the reading from Revelation today, the New Testament reading, we hear about Michael as that great warrior angel in heaven, fighting. There's a war in heaven of all places. What's going on? He's casting out a dragon, or that, it says, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. There is no place for this deceiving power in heaven, where truth prevails, of course, but it still has power on earth, and that's where it ends up. And the reading that we hear today, the reading says, woe, that's bad news, woe, oh dear, woe to the earth and to the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath. For he knows his time is short. He's going to get defeated in the end. So we, on earth, we are vulnerable to this spirit of deception and divisiveness. It confuses us. We're often, aren't we, we're often split, even in our own heads. We're often in conflict, even our inner turmoil. We're often we're warring amongst ourselves or an inner battle going on in us. How are we supposed to know what to think, or who to believe, or what, or who to trust? Now, in the Gospel reading, we hear that Jesus recognises in Nathaniel somebody who isn't, isn't suffering from this confusion and turmoil. Jesus says, here is truly an Israelite, a fellow Jew, they're all Jews. Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel, he is not in the grip of that deceiver of the world, the devil. He's not deceived, he's not confused, he's not deluded. 
warring with itself, is seeing clearly and truly. And this, this leads him to recognize the authority of Jesus. He comes out with a whole list of special things about Jesus. You're amazing. You're all these things. You're the Son of God. I see you as you are. And Jesus he acknowledges his insights and he says that Nathaniel, he says, you're going to see better than this. You're going to see visions of angels. Nathaniel is going to see heavenly realities, truths that are usually way beyond us. And that's a bit like the Old Testament reading that we heard today. Now, a very famous passage, lots of us know this one. Jacob, he goes to a certain place, well, that's a sermon for another day, and he has a dream of angels. Angels ascending and descending between the heavens and where he is sleeping. And in his dream, he hears the voice of God telling him that his descendants are going to be countless. They're going to live in this land. Now, Jacob, Jacob is otherwise known as Israel. He's given that name. And his descendants, they are the Israelites. They become the Jews, the Jewish people. So God gives Jacob a vision of angels and a message that is to encourage him and his descendants to come through thick and thin. But it is one, I think, that it might encourage any of us. And if you include yourself in the faith of the Bible, as it's a, a universal, inclusive faith, you are encouraged to trust that God is speaking to you in these words too. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. The powerful words, I will keep you wherever you go. And Jacob wakes up and he remembers his dream of, his, of those angels and he believes it. Surely, he says, surely God is in this place and I didn't know it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. Now, house of God, a little aside, Bethel, that's the name of came, the place came to be called Bethel because Bethel means house of God. So he's named the place Bethel. So this story of the angels, the message, I am with you, says God, is passed on through the generations and it's come to us in the Bible. In this story of Jacob, it's actually God who's speaking to him in his dream, rather than the, the angels that are moving about. But in the Bible, there are many instances of angels speaking. It's one of their main jobs. The word angel itself is Greek and it means a messenger. So an angel is a messenger, a messenger particularly of God. Jacob, he has no doubt about this dream. But what about us here on earth? That spirit of deception and confusion. It's powerful, isn't it? How, how do we recognise a real angel if we see one, a real angel of God? How do we know it's not some other angel, some other untrustworthy messenger? How do we know we're not being deceived? Paul, if, if you know, you know in, the, in, in the letter, second letter to the Corinthians, he, he's writing to a people who have got this problem who to believe, he's saying they're going after the wrong people, the wrong leaders. How do you know who to trust? Paul says to them in his letter, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So he said, be careful. And this can make us rightfully cautious. Even the shiny, dazzly ones might be tricking us. Sometimes we don't know. Our judgment, hmm, 
Perhaps it depends on our worldview, our, what, we, what, we, what we make of the world, our own heart, our own gut feelings, what we know in our bones. How else do we know what's true? But for a Christian, the measure, I guess, is surely Jesus. His life, his words, his call to self-giving love. This truly is what defines the way, the truth, the life. By all means, we can get it wrong still. We can be confused, misled, even by people saying that they're teaching the word of Jesus. We can be misled, be dazzled by fake angels putting on a show. We are human, we live on earth, and de deceit, confusion runs amok. And I think, I think, it's our intent. I think it's the loving, honest intention in our hearts which God sees. Just as Jesus sees Nathaniel as honest, he says, an honest, true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Right, one of my favourite angel stories is about someone who gets this badly wrong. He doesn't even notice the angel. You might know this story. This is in Numbers chapter 22. Now, there's a bad-tempered prophet called Balaam. Balaam is riding a donkey, and he thinks he's on a mission from God. He had a dream, but it all seems a bit confusing at this point. What's he doing? Where's he going? He thinks he's doing the right thing, and he's very determined about it. So he's riding along on this donkey, but three times the donkey swerves off, off the path. And on one of these occasions, the donkey is going down an alleyway and he squeezes Balaam's foot against the wall. And Balaam is really cross. Now, the donkey is swerving off the path because the donkey can see something that Balaam can't see. The donkey can see an angel blocking the path with a big sword. And the donkey, quite rightly, is going, uh oh better get out of the way. But because Balaam can't see the donkey, he's punish he can't see the donkey, can't see the angel, he's punishing the donkey, beating the donkey. In the end, God intervenes. God gives the donkey speech. The donkey can suddenly talk. So it can protest the unfair treatment. It may really be interesting if this happened a bit more often, wouldn't it? And the angel suddenly becomes visible to Bala. To me, I think this is the mark of a true messenger of God. Once a being, someone who has compassion for the oppressed and the voiceless, and will give them voice, speak for them. Now, this is what it says. Bala saw the angel of God standing in the road suddenly, with his drawn sword in his hand, that's the angel, and Balaam bowed down, falling on his face. And the angel, the angel said to him, this is a bit I love, he said, why have you struck your donkey three times? Of all the passages in the Bible, an angel appears to Balaam and tells him off for hitting the donkey. Why have you struck this donkey? I came to stop you because I don't want you making this journey. The donkey saw me and turned away from me three times. If it hadn't turned away from me, I might have killed you by now and let the donkey live. And then Balaam said to the angel, I have sinned. I have sinned. Beat the donkey. I didn't know that you were standing in the road to stop me. Mm. I have sinned. I didn't know you were there. I didn't know. I pushed on with my plan. I was sure I was right. And I was sure of what God wanted. Yeah. And the test of this is it's, if it's at the expense of another, some, some, Innocent creature, 
Does the H of F look? And now I know you're with me. I see differently. I can see clearly. Jacob, with the vision of the angels going up and down, and Balaam, who doesn't see the angel, they have these angelic encounters. And the, the encounters are very different, but they share the realization that God's everywhere and there is nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide from the divine presence. Balaam's response is, I got it wrong. I sinned. I acted in ignorance. I didn't know you were there. Well, if he, if he thought God was watching, and that's maybe a bit spooky, well, watching, would he, he make him behave differently? But God is there. Jacob's response is, wow, this is awesome. Let's make an altar. This is fantastic. What would our response be? Bit of both, perhaps. And perhaps you've seen angels, or believe you might have seen angels, or perhaps not. And if not, why not? You might say. Well, perhaps you have. Perhaps we have, but we just didn't realise. The Bible says we can live with the expectation of seeing angels every day. Hebrews chapter 13. What does it say? It says, let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, you might know this story traces all the way back to Abraham and Sarah, who enter entertained angels long, long ago. Part of our great work here at St. Chad and St. Mark's, it is in welcoming, isn't it? It's in hospitality to one another and to people who might well start off as strangers to us. But then we discover that strangers are not so strange. They are our neighbours. Our neighbours who we are called to love. And so they become we. And we expand our welcome and our sense of community and friendship as we learn from one another, learning in love. So especially this weekend, as we're so close to opening our amazing new kitchen through there, which is central to our place of welcome and our hospitality, that message of St. Michael and all the angels rings very true. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. What does that mean for, for you, for us, individuals and collectively as a community? Look around you. Who do you see? Who do you see sitting together? Who do you see coming through the door in the week? Do you see strangers? Do you see potential angels? Real angels in these seats. Angels. With this in mind, there's hospitality, the angels amongst them. We turn now, as we do every week, to the Eucharist, which is our weekly invitation to encounter with the sacred presence through the hospitality of sharing bread and wine, the wisdom's table, Jesus' table, in the words of Jacob, just as we heard today. Surely, the Eternal One is in this place. And I did not know it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. 
Amen.